March 2020, the university switched to online teaching in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. After the initial peak, prevalence of COVID-19 had remained relatively low over the summer vacation prior to the start of the next academic year. To ensure that students would be safe to return and that most teaching and extracurricular activities could resume, the university needed to be able to monitor and control outbreaks and take measures to reduce the rate of transmission. It was anticipated that there would be an increase in prevalence after initial restrictions had lifted and students returned and mixed. As part of this, an asymptomatic screening programme was envisioned to provide visibility of transmission between students and allow the university to take targeted actions. The university managed to get an allocation of 2,000 tests per week from the Anne McLaren building, located on the Addenbrooke site, which was being set up as a government testing lighthouse lab. The initial goal of the programme was to test all students living in college accommodation, a total of over 16,000 people. The programme's clinical leads, Nick Matheson and Ben Warne, proposed implementing a pool testing programme, wherein eight to 10 student swabs would be grouped into a single test and only if the pooled result was positive would those students be individually tested. In late August, once the pooled testing approach was deemed feasible, Duncan McFarlane was called in to advise on the programme's logistics. A team of IFM staff, students and graduates was assembled to rapidly develop a logistics system and network to enable the thousands of weekly tests to be delivered, administered and taken to the lab. In early September, the programme was announced to the press placing additional importance on the pilot and rollouts deadlines and success. The programme faced some significant initial challenges getting up and running, particularly from an operational point of view. There were no systems established, no infrastructure in place or, or key personnel to handle the programme's logistics. This was amplified by the fact that there were 37 different colleges which would need to be interfaced with, each having over 50 delivery sites amongst them. Only limiting testing capacity was made available for the program to use, so we were going to need to use this pool testing approach in order to gather enough test samples to cover all the student body. There were only five weeks between the initial request for logistics assistance and the launch date of the program. And in fact, there were only three weeks available until the trialling of the pool testing program. It was also highly likely that during this period and beyond that, that the specifications for the way the testing would be running would change. And finally, it was identified that the importance of student flows would probably be just as important to the system as the material flows, which would be the standard issues that a logistics team would be needing to deal with. And clearly student flows at the best of times are not the easiest to control. The high-level logistics plan settled on for this program was relatively simple and linear. It started with the procurement of parts and the manufacturing of test kits for the pooled sampling. Those kits were then distributed to the colleges. The students then took their swab samples and then the used or completed test kits were couriered on from the colleges to the testing lab. And finally, the samples were then PCR tested so the results could be handled and distributed. Including student flows into the top level process map illustrates just how integral they were to the system's logistics. Colleges needed to be able to manage the last mile distribution and collection of test kits to students and the student pools needed to be correctly administered and submit their tests. This created large numbers of opportunities for multiple uncontrolled failure modes from late submission and incorrectly packaged samples to unforeseen IT problems. Once results were received from the lab, students become involved again. If their pool test was negative, they only need that information. But if the pool test is positive, their follow-on tests will be required and enhanced contact tracing may be undertaken. Contact tracing requires significant collaboration with the students, tightly integrating them into the system, relying on their cooperation for that part of the program. With only three weeks to launch a pilot program and five weeks to roll out the entire test pool testing program to all the colleges, shortcuts had to be found in the purchasing, recruiting and delivery functions to enable the rapid setup of the program. 
In setting up the program, the use of existing latent facilities where possible meant the scale-up could be achieved with minimal friction while retaining flexibility and control. Highly flexible people who are, let's say, happy to be dropped in it with a track record of solving problems in finite timescales were recruited to perform the scale-up and ongoing operations management. The facilities were then developed in such a way as to be easily configured and rapidly reconfigurable as the needs changed. Finally, the assumption that the problem faced at the end of the program would not be the same as the problem at the start was carried all throughout the program and proved to be a very useful assumption to have made. The screening program offered three test kits. Two test kits were offered directly to students and one was offered internally to the engineering pod for symptomatic staff and students. All test kits contained two recycled plastic bags, an absorbent pad and a test tube containing viral transport medium or VTM fluid. Once swabs had been taken and inserted into the VTM tube, it was double bagged with the absorbent pads to comply with medical transport protocol. The pool test kit came in a brown envelope and contained multiple swabs which were all deposited into a single tube at the time of swabbing, grouping that pool into a single result. The kits were supplied to pools of students in both college and private accommodation. If one or people in the pool had COVID, the test would return positive. Only then would individual follow-on tests be issued to that specific pool to determine who the positive members of the pool were. By pooling students, the number of PCR laboratory tests that needed to be performed was reduced by a factor of between five and 10 times. The individual test was issued in a white envelope and only contained a single swab. These are used for follow-on confirmatory tests in the event a pooled test result came back positive. The individual test kits were also used as part of the university's test to check program, as well as providing end of term testing for students wanting a COVID test prior to leaving Cambridge. Inbound deliveries to the production facility were tracked using a simple QR based code tracking app called ITEMIT. QR codes were dotted around the production facility and tracked inventory as it moved between rooms. Data could then be extracted from the ITEMIT API to provide real time monitoring of stock levels and trigger reorders based on forecasted demand, avoiding unexpected stockouts that could impact production. Typically, production ran on a single line, but the program has run up to three simultaneous lines in the past. The line contained three core stations and a few supporting activities, which are fulfilled either by a fourth team member or the two team members not working on the bottleneck station. Production was driven by test kit label printing, whose IDs were generated by the IT backend developed by UIS that underpins the entire program. Envelopes were printed with the generic test kit information and the labels were then applied. Packing all generic kit components into the envelope came next. This also happened to be the system bottleneck. Following this, a barcode of each EM tube was linked to the test kit label on the IT system by scanning each one's barcode. The tube was then inserted into the kit and the kit was sealed. Finally, a simple quality control check was performed, preventing production of duplicate kits and identifying incomplete kits before it was moved into finished goods. The program used decentralized push inventory management, which maintained stock buffers at each point in the network where a potential disruption could occur. Three times a week, test kits were shipped out to colleges to replenish their safety stock to an appropriate level. Each college received a tailored quantity of kits for the week, determined using a combination of the college's most recent stock take, previous week's supply, their historical weekly usage, and the number of testing pools registered at that college. The University Messenger Service, or UMS, is the university's internal courier service. In keeping with the program's approach to using latent resources, UMS provided access to two couriers who did all of the physical moving of test kits for the program. They were responsible for getting new test kits from production to colleges and for getting used test kits from colleges to the lab. The drivers ran on independent schedules and had separate responsibilities. One schedule was fixed capacity with a higher priority on punctuality and the other had a fixed baseline capacity, one delivery per day, but could be varied to increase delivery frequency in the case of high demand levels, such as end of term testing or potential outbreaks. 
the first courier, was responsible for replenishing college test kit inventory levels and delivering pooled college tests to the lab. The second courier was responsible for cycling test kits from drop boxes to the lab. Drop boxes held both pooled test kits from the students living out of college accommodation and all individual test kits. Varial demand was reflected in individual test kit usage and, if that increased, the courier could simply increase the number of collections per day. To understand the distribution logistics, stepping through one courier's delivery rhythm is helpful. Starting on Monday, the driver began their day at the production facility, collecting boxes of new test kits to replenish the inventory of colleges whose students were testing that day. They delivered these kits to colleges, swapping out boxes of new kits for corresponding boxes that were full of used, pooled test kits from the students for that week. These tests were taken straight to the lab, where the kits were tipped out and the transport boxes stored in the UMS van overnight. The following day, the empty boxes were returned to the production facility, where the next load of new test kits were collected. In determining how to split colleges across delivery days, we got to see an ideal example of applying theoretical optimization techniques in practice. You have optimization objectives, achieving the shortest delivery route for each day and balancing the route duration across days. You have inputs, the location of all college drop-offs and collection points, and you have constraints, the number of days the deliveries can be split over. This is all the information required to define an optimization problem. So Dr. Ajith Parklad and Rishi Dada went and solved it, providing us three optimal classes of colleges for our career's delivery days. The collegiate university is rather decentralized, much more so than the external perspective that likes to brand the university as one big monolithic organization. Each college is its own institution. They each have their own ways of doing things, their own little idiosyncrasies. As such, intra-college operations, um, which is the distribution of the test kits to the students, we leave those up to each individual college. Um, as much complexity as possible was removed from these operations and, and shifted to within the system that we control so that we could manage it better. In the first term of the programme, a specific method of kit distribution to students was prescribed to all colleges. Standardising the process in a form that all would be able to follow presented an initial challenge, but the real difficulty was faced in attempting to ensure that colleges were following the process. Instead of doubling down on this top-down management approach, we realised that individual colleges were in a more appropriate position to determine how to run their internal operations, and left the details up to them. Provided medical safety requirements were adhered to, and the students received the test kits on time, the colleges were relatively free to determine their own methods of distribution. The UMS courier dropped off and scanned in their delivery for the day. Excalibur's first task was to sort and separate out all potentially void samples, for example, improperly packaged or leaking tubes. These were set aside and a senior lab member would separately evaluate each flagged sample to decide which could be recovered and which would need to be discarded. The tubes were then unpackaged and held in lab racks. At this point, the tube barcodes were scanned to associate their ID with their tray location. The samples were then transferred with a pipette into a smaller tray and heat treated at 60 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes, followed by a thermal shock treatment of 90 degrees Celsius for one minute to inactivate the virus. A universal lab robot was used to pipette PCR reagent into a second lab tray, followed by another lab robot that batch pipettes the student samples into the PCR reagent tray. The samples were then centrifuged and a positive control was pipetted into four reserved tray cells. The PCR test cycle was then run. It is worth noting that PCR tests don't return a simple binary, definitely positive or definitely negative result. The process operates in cycles, each cycle amplifying a fragment of viral RNA until it can be detected. If a test returns a positive result, it is accompanied by a cycle threshold, CT value, indicating the number of cycles required for detection. The lower the CT value, the larger the viral load in the original sample. Positive control samples return a CT value around 18. The programme defines its positive detection cutoff at a CT value of 35. In contrast, lateral flow tests, which detect viral proteins rather than RNA and have no amplification step, have a lower sensitivity than PCR. 
At CT values of 15, indicating a high viral load, the lateral flow tests detect around 100% of infections. But this falls to 40% at a CT value of 35. Given that many of the asymptomatic positive results seen in the programme have high CT values, the sensitivity of PCR testing has been integral to the programme's success. The following morning, results were assigned to their respective sample barcodes and the data transferred to a secure server hosted by the University Clinical School on the biomedical campus. Here, they were matched to the personal details of each student. Results were sent to individuals by text message and, if positive, followed up by contact from the programme's clinical support team. Tracking, as in traceability and data visibility, was one of the pieces of overhead that was of great value to the programme's operational success. Our tracking systems were split into an internal operation system that specifically facilitated operations management activities and a separate IT backend developed by the University Information Service, the UIS. A critical aspect of the program was ensuring the on-time collection and delivery of test kits, particularly transport of samples that had been taken by students as results needed to be delivered within 24 hours. A feedback loop was required to ensure that all boxes were transported correctly and none went missing. A Python web app was developed to check the last seen location of all boxes against their expected location according to the daily courier schedule. Box locations were recorded with Itemit's QR code scanning capability. Our Python web app had access to this data via their API. It then cross-checked all boxes against their expected location given by the static schedule. Finally, the boxes whose expected locations did not match were displayed on the web app front end, both in tabular form and on a map with their last known location. As a result, no student kits have been lost in transit. All samples taken by students have successfully reached the lab. Built by a small army of developers from the University Information Services during the program's initial phase, the program's IT backend provided a highly robust and reliable system to underpin all the critical activities and tracking required to produce test kits, test students for COVID and supply them with the results. The system consisted of an Azure database backend acting as a single source of truth for all kit production, student, household and pool data, pool and student test kit usage and results distribution. The creation and handling of relationships between these aspects was critical to enabling the programme to provide around 2,000 pool tests per week. Students interfaced with the Microsoft Power App that had been specifically developed to minimise the user-facing friction to taking a test. Students simply scanned a QR code on, on a test kit to register their participation in that specific kit. And because the test tube inside the kit was registered to the same test kit during production, Results received from the lab could be linked back to students and their pools, meaning that results could be issued through an automated email or text message service. Any positive results were fed to the program's student follow-up team, allowing these sensitive medical results to be handled appropriately. Speaking of handling medical data, all test results were pseudo anonymized That means that the laboratory testing partner had no means to link test tubes back to any individual or group of students. The relationship was only maintained in an ISO 27001 secure physical server on the Adam Brooks Hospital site, and access was restricted to a subset of program administrators responsible for dealing with medical result data. The fact that the underpinning IT system was very well engineered at the beginning of the program meant that it was highly robust from an early stage. As a result, it required relatively little ongoing maintenance for the duration of the program. It provided both a reliable backbone for the program, as well as useful historical data for additional analysis. Because the IT backend built by the UIS team was comprehensive, robust, and could be queried by the operations team using standard SQL, it was possible to extract useful and accurate operational performance data. The team was able to use this resource to rapidly answer ad hoc questions as well as build functional dashboards linking directly to the database. This is probably the most useful dashboard figure to get an understanding of the program's operational performance and history. The bars represent weekly test kit production figures, light blue being pulled kits and dark blue being individual kits. The lines represent weekly test kit usage by students, orange being pulled kit usage and purple being individual kit usage. 
quite a few insights can be gleaned from this figure. The first of which is the immediate reflection of a fundamental system change between the first and second terms. In the first term, the program provided specific pooled test kits tailored to each pool. Each kit was assigned to a pool using specific usage data at the point of production, creating a two-week lead time between kit production and actual usage. It also meant that the usage data for this period is not reflective of the actual usage, because regardless of whether a pool actually swapped that week, the kit was recorded as used. Furthermore, weekly production figures were remarkably consistent throughout this period, because kits were produced for every single pool in the system two weeks in advance with little consideration for wastage. At the start of 2021, another lockdown was announced, and it was highly unclear how many students would be returning to the university. The program made the decision to change the offering to generic test kits and move to a push inventory management system with stock distributed both amongst the colleges and the finished goods production area. This provided numerous benefits, significantly enhancing the robustness of the system as a potential production downtime would no longer result in service interruptions, avoiding excessive wastage in the event of a reduced number of students returning to Cambridge, and allowing for rapid onboarding of students, no longer requiring a two-week lead time between sign-up and first pool test. With the transition to inventory management-driven production, the program experienced some bulwark challenges, primarily due to the lack of accurate visibility of college-level stock data, relying on a combination of kit usage data, historical supply data, and self-reported stock takes from each college. These were smoothed out in the third term, with high production weeks being used to build additional contingency buffer as the program's future became clearer. Over the course of delivering more than 80,000 test kits to students, the program has faced many operating challenges. A lot of them could be considered typical challenges for operations managers, but the nature of the evolving pandemic, along with the degree of uncertainty throughout the program's life cycle, meant that some were particularly problematic and noteworthy. The program faced component delays from suppliers in China, India and Belgium. And the reasons for these varied from factory fires to COVID waves spreading in those suppliers' countries that resulted in legislated export restrictions. At one point, this meant even our backup supplier for a certain part couldn't source inventory, requiring a joint sourcing effort from the program coordination team and our laboratory testing partner to source that component from another supplier, but making sure that it was still compatible with the standard of the process we were running. The program existed consistently in a state of flux. In fact, one member likes to say that the only constant throughout the program has been its rate of change. The system had to be adapted to more than 30 changes in requirements, including multiple time extensions to the program, which was only meant to last nine weeks originally, um, extensions of the service offering to include additional student groups and additional test types, and entirely changing laboratory testing providers without the service interruption. It's been incredible that we've managed to maintain this rate of change and adaptation, um, despite all of the challenges thrown at us during the COVID pandemic. HR was probably one of the strangest challenges the program ended up facing. All production staff were existing university employees that would otherwise have been furloughed for most of the pandemic. The government program paid furloughed employees 80% of their salary and was topped up to 100% by the university, which led to an unforeseen and strange dynamic, mismatching employee and employer incentives. From the production staff's perspective, work on the program appeared to be voluntary, as all their colleagues on furlough were receiving identical compensation. Whereas from the university's perspective, employees working in the program were still expensed at their full salary, as if they were working normally. This became more of an issue as the program life continued to be extended. The line work was relatively monotonous, having a low skill ceiling and not being particularly interesting or engaging. In the early months of the program, the feeling that work was for something good, keeping Cambridge safe, helped maintain workforce motivation with a sense of purpose. However, as we all became more comfortable with the pandemic and the program's lifetime kept extending, workforce motivation began to flag. Compensating for this fundamental perspective difference proved to be quite a challenge, and only surface level treatments were possible at the operational level. The biggest change made 
was the introduction of Weekend Wednesday, splitting the program's original Monday to Thursday work week in half by moving the additional day off to Wednesday. This meant the team was never more than two days away from a day off, which they reported to be a morale boost. To wrap up, it's useful perhaps to sum up some of our hard and soft learnings from this experience. As far as hard learnings go, there were several key findings. Firstly, we found that starting off making use of existing facilities wherever possible provided great benefits to the program. It effectively gave us a head start at the beginning where time was really tight and meant we could ramp up rapidly. And once we were operational, being in-house also meant that the system remained flexible and could be changed as required. So connected to this, a second learning was we knew that rapidly changing specifications were clearly going to be an issue throughout the program. And one of the approaches that saved us in new, an innumerable number of times was always assuming and anticipating that things might go wrong with the operations being put together so we could design the system in such a way that it was resilient and able to cope with those eventualities. Thirdly, uh, in the hard category, simplifying and standardising those parts of our logistics operation that fell out of our control. For example, the management of sample taking inside each of the colleges, it proved to be really beneficial. This strategy contributed significantly to the robustness of the system and again allowed us to retain the ability to be flexible as requirements changed. Now, in terms of the soft learnings, one of the things that stood out was the degree to which perspectives differ across disciplines in this context of a pandemic. The clinical understanding of what is and what isn't risky when it came to COVID was strikingly different to a non-clinical perspective. And this affected a lot of the way we ran the logistics program. For example, some porters in some colleges were initially hesitant even to go near a box of unused test kits because they were related in some way to COVID. And that required significant rethinking of the way in which the uh, test kits were distributed. Whereas the clinical team involved was a lot more measured. We were also surprised by the inventiveness of students uh, and the, th the type of things that students did, not deliberately, but as a means of changing the way the testing process ran. And what we found was that to design a robust system, it required a number of iterations up front. And the end users, as I said, found a multitude of incorrect ways to use it, which actually took a number of weeks and quite a lot of communications to eradicate. Thirdly, and not un unexpectedly, there was a great deal of stress surrounding COVID-19 that affected both the students and the team members, which certainly had an impact on the way the program had to be communicated, delivered, and then run internally. And further, we frequently found that people not directly involved in the operations tended to assume that the logistics was, could just happen uh, instantaneously perhaps, but certainly without too much fuss. And this led to some considerable misunderstandings and communicating the quantity and the complexity of the work involved, along with the lead times required to execute a lot of the logistics processes was not intuitive and needed to be communicated frequently and particularly early on in the project life cycle. And a final observation was that as logistics chains go, this system was really quite challenging because of the people, i.e. the students, uh, in the middle of the process, playing an integral role in its success or failure. And the closed loop nature of the logistics chain, so moving test kits out to students and then receiving completed sample kits back from the students was similar in some ways to the more sustainable closed loop supply chains, which are now becoming more common in the industrial space as well.